There are hundreds of ancient Chinese weapons. They come in every imaginable shape and size. There are weapons that stab, slash, cut, scratch, smash, bash, and claw. In the hands of a kung fu expert, they are all lethal weapons. We count down ten of the most devastating kung fu weapons in order to uncover what might be the deadliest Chinese killing machine of all time. It takes skill to wield Chinese lethal weapons. Though Kung Fu is often considered an unarmed and defensive discipline of Chinese martial arts, its techniques can be applied to all weapons, often making them even more deadly. Kung Fu weapons come in countless shapes and sizes. Some, such as swords and spears, are known throughout the world. Others, such as the long-handled saber, erme needles, antlers and dark judge brushes, are distinctively Chinese. But no matter how outlandish their design or how poetic their name, they can all kill. Join us as we count down ten of the deadliest Chinese weapons. Saber and the sword are two of the most formidable weapons in the Kung Fu arsenal. The sword, with its thin straight blade, is known in China as the gentleman of all weapons. Its heavier relation, the saber, bears an even more exalted title. The saber is called the master of all weapons because it causes more damage to the enemy's body than any other Kung Fu weapon. and agile. Like a flying phoenix, that's the sword. Its main form of attack is the thrust. Savage and powerful, like a fierce tiger, that's the saber. It's used to chop, slash, and hack. The thin blade of the Chinese sword has razor-sharp edges on both sides. Because it has two edges, it requires more practice and technique. While larger and heavier, the saber has just a single edge. Therefore, there is a saying, saber, power, won by strength, sword, soft, won by technique. The sword and the saber match the human body's proportions. Being neither too long or short, they are perfect for use. Within their effective striking distances, they are the best weapons. Little Tiger has practiced Kung Fu for over 20 years. A former member of the Guangzhou martial arts team, he is an expert on sword and saber techniques. Sword play is brisk, graceful and dynamic. Sword play requires more than just a strong arm. In thrusting, the shoulder and the wrist must form a straight line, and the movement comes from the waist. Because it's a straight line, it's fast, merciless, and accurate. The thrust is the sword's most lethal attack. Flicking involves lifting up the blade from below. Pointing uses the tip of the sword to stab the enemy's shoulder or wrist. It can serve to disarm one's opponent. Chopping means bringing down the blade from overhead. This puts your body weight as well as your strength behind the blow. And you can even jump up to chop downwards.
You bring out the saber's power with your own power. The sideways slash is another important saber technique. The fighter can straight slash or reverse slash to attack an enemy's neck or neck. Wrapping around the head is a distinctive saber move. It is both offensive and defensive. The move is unique to the saber. It allows ones to neutralize an enemy's attack and to immediately launch a counter-attack of one's own. In China, swords were more than just weapons. In ancient times, it wasn't only soldiers who carried swords. Scholars, philosophers, even poets wore them. A sword on the belt was a badge of honor, proof that the owner was a master of swords. In the cut and thrust of battle, an enormous variety of strange and exotic weapons were used. Multi-bladed rings and tritons, deadly needles, lightning fast whips and dreaded metal brushes. Our countdown of China's most deadly weapons continues after the break. The Chinese have devised a huge number of weapons over thousands of years. We're counting down China's most deadly weapons. At number 10 was the saber and the sword. Now we continue the countdown at number 9 with one of the oldest weapons in the Kung Fu arsenal. When the first emperor of China died over 2,000 years ago, he was buried with more than 7,000 life-sized terracotta warriors. It was only fitting. In life, the emperor used his army to turn several warring states into a single country. While the terracotta army is only made of clay, they once held real weapons in their hands. Chief among them were the bow and the crossbow. Bows and arrows have been used since the old Stone Age. Bows were usually fashioned from bamboo or wood. Their bowstrings were made from cow tendons, deer skin, or even silk. The traditional bows and arrows of China were often used as the first line of attack on the battlefield. They had a range of up to 100 meters. An experienced bowman could make around 10 shots per minute. Conventional arrows were, however, light and could do little harm to an armored soldier. More powerful than the traditional bow and arrow was the mechanical crossbow. They could shoot a heavier arrow further and more accurately than a traditional bow. Some could even shoot five arrows at a time. An ingeniously simple mechanism holds the bowstring in place, releasing it when required by means of a trigger, shooting the bow. Chinese soldiers used crossbows more than a thousand years before they appeared in Europe. They continued to use them until the last years of the 19th century. The mixture of copper and tin to make bronze resulted in the creation of many deadly new weapons. In terms of efficacy, bronze weapons were a lot sharper. They were sturdy yet supple, keen etched but hard to break. The invention of bronze weapons some 4,000 years ago revolutionized warfare. Traditional weapons such as swords became stronger and sharper, but more importantly, new weapons were developed. Around the 5th century BC began what is known as the Warring States period. China was splintered into many small states which waged incessant war against each other. 
having a well-equipped army was essential to a state's survival. As in ancient Egypt of the same period, chariot warfare was the order of the day. Long shafted weapons called pole arms were the foot soldiers' best defense against chariots and mounted troops. Pole arms could be used to unhorse cavalry and take down chariots. While Chinese spears were much like the European pikes used thousands of years later, the bronze headed Gur was a uniquely Chinese weapon. When Chinese history entered the Bronze Age, the standard weapon was the girl. During the Eastern Child period, the army standard issue weapon, much like today's rifle, was initially the girl, which then developed into the Chinese habit. The girl was a distinctive ancient Chinese pole arm. It had a right-angled blade affixed atop a bamboo or wooden pole. The upper horizontal blade of this gur is about 20 centimeters in length, and the lower vertical one was about 15 centimeters. In the age of ancient warfare, the gur and the spear were stock military equipment. With its hook shape, the Gur could cool down mounted soldiers. The Gur's main offensive moves were hooking and stabbing. The attack would be targeted at the enemy's heart or head. The sickle-like blade was used to hook and slash the enemy's vital parts. The optimum angle of the blade was a great discovery for armorers. According to an ancient Chinese text, if the angle between the upper and lower blades of the gur is too great, it makes it difficult to hook the enemy. If the angle is too small, it would be difficult to slash through the target. After years of refinement, the perfect design was discovered. An angle of around 100 degrees was reckoned to be the most lethal. <laughs> Having spent almost half a century on the study of Chinese archaeology, Professor Yang Hong thinks there's an even better example of ancient ingenuity. In ancient China, the gur and the spear were the soldier's standard weapons. By cleverly uniting the sickle-shaped blade of the gur with the sharp head of the spear, armorers created a formidable new weapon, a halberd, the Chinese called a ji, combining the best aspects of both weapons. It could step and thrust, as well as hook and chop. Its effectiveness on the battlefield was like one person fighting with two weapons at the same time. The ancient Ji had one or more sickle-shaped blades for hooking and chopping, as well as a spearhead for thrusting. The Ji was the stock battlefield weapon. Foot soldiers used it to pull down mounted troops. But mounted troops used the G as well. It was effective against both other riders and against foot soldiers. The multi purpose G quickly became the soldier's favorite weapon. With increased horizontal cutting edges, there were more opportunities to hook, cut, slash one's opponent. As a fusion of the spear and the gur, it could utilize the spear's thrusting attack to stab straight at the enemy. 
while the sickle-shaped blade could hook the limbs of enemies. The staff, and its pointed version, the spear, is the most basic kung fu weapon. Its use requires flexibility in body movements, lightness and agility in footwork, and swiftness and steadiness in turns and somersaults. Because the staff is a two-handed weapon, it teaches balance and coordination. It is for these reasons that it is the starter weapon taught to aspiring kung fu fighters. Long weapons are any weapons that are as tall or taller than the person wielding them. There is no set length for a long weapon. In fact, there is a saying in the Kung Fu world that one inch longer is one inch stronger. Offensively, long weapons extend the range of attack. Defensively, long weapons make it difficult for opponents to approach close enough to do damage. Pole arms, such as spears and halberds, are the military versions of long weapons. But even the civilian versions could cause some serious damage. Ken Yun from Hong Kong started learning Kung Fu as a child. A Kung Fu choreographer for 16 years, he is an expert in all kinds of exotic weaponry and killing techniques. He is wielding a long-handled saber called the Guan Bao. The heavy blade is a cross between a saber and an axe. One legendary Guan Bao weighed about 40 kilograms and was said to be able to bring down a horse. Whips are called soft weapons in Chinese, but they are anything but soft. Chinese whips are made of metal links, not leather. They have a solid weight at the end that can break bones and fracture skulls. In battle, soft weapons like whips were often used as secondary weapons. They came in handy when the main weapon, like the sword or spear, was lost. Because they bend, soft weapons could be easily hidden. In the hands of an expert, they make for a dazzling show of skill and coordination. The nine-sectioned whip is made from metal chain links that give it flexibility, while the sharp metal weight at the end packs a fearsome punch. Soft weapons are among the most difficult to use. It's hard to master, and secondly, it can strike in a curve. When spunk around, it interferes with the enemy's vision. The whip was a favorite assassin's weapon off the battlefield. The sharp weight can strike unexpectedly at an opponent's head, even from behind. But there is a downside. Whips are notoriously difficult to use. Students of Kung Fu are more likely to do themselves an injury with a whip than when learning any other weapon. There's a saying in Chinese martial arts that rather practice the sword or saber than the hook or whip. That's because it's easy to hurt yourself with a whip. In the hands of a kung fu expert, even innocuous domestic objects like chopsticks can be lethal weapons. Because they are unexpected, they are doubly deadly. This is actually a very common type of weapon. It relies on the users with power, manifest in a straight line to strike at an enemy's body. Throwing a chopstick requires more than simple coordination. 
Martial artists first concentrate Kung Fu Qi energy in their hand and wrist. When thrown with Kung Fu force, ordinary chopsticks can penetrate a wooden board. In the hands of trained assassins, sharpened metal chopsticks were deadly weapons. The targets for the chopsticks' piercing attacks are the chest, head, and core. look harmless, but in the hands of an expert, even it has lethal potential. Fans were a sign of gentility, but in an emergency, an elegant scholar could be transformed into a deadly assassin. Killer fans had sharpened veins to cut and slash the enemy. Fans could also be used defensively, like a bullfighter's cane. And fans could be turned into an effective concealed weapon, able to be taken into places where more obvious weapons could not. Assassins had special fans with razor-sharp blades that could slice as well as a knife. <laughs> Calligraphy is one of the fine arts of China, but these metal brushes were not used to paint characters. They were used for a far darker art, the martial arts, called dark judge brushes, they had a single purpose, to kill. About 20 centimeters in length, their pointed tips are used for striking. Thrusting is very direct. You just step right at the enemy. Dark judge brushes are mainly used to attack pressure points, the sternum, the heart, the throat, the temples, as well as the eyes are all targets. Small weapons like dark judge brushes are almost always used in pairs. Kung Fu teaches the use of both hands. While one hand distracts the enemy, the other strikes. Dark judge brushes are primarily stealth weapons used to attack unsuspecting opponents. First of all, thrusting. Penetrating is thrusting with even greater lethal effect. Lifting is to first neutralize an opponent's attack before counterattacking. In the hands of an assassin, even everyday household items can become deadly weapons. After the break, strange exotic weapons and the ultimate flying killers. Counting down China's top 10 lethal weapons. At number 10 are razor-sharp swords and sabers. At number 9 are long-range weapons, bows and crossbows. Favorite weapons among soldiers, spears and halberds, come in at 8. At number 7 are long weapons, six to eight foot fighting stars. Whips, soft weapons that pack a big punch, are at six. And at number five are common objects lethal in the hands of Kung Fu masters. But some of China's most ingenious weapons were never meant to be seen. Ancient Chinese weapons makers made many important discoveries. Chinese armorers made the first crossbows. Chinese alchemists made the first gunpowder. And Chinese artisans made some of the most sophisticated mechanical weapons the world has ever seen. So-called sleeve arrows are ancient spring-loaded devices that could be hidden within the sleeves of a traditional Chinese gown. Sometimes the tip was even poison. Consisting of a metal tube approximately 18 centimeters in length, a miniature arrow is placed inside. A spring-loaded mechanism within the tube shoots the arrow out. The sleeve arrow was very easy to use. It's shot by a spring, 
You place the arrow inside the tube. Cock it. And then set the spring. Activate this trigger. And the arrow shoots out from the tube. The sleeve arrow's mechanical principle involves a spring at the bottom of the tube, on top of which is a metal plate. A triggering device called the butterfly's wing holds back the arrow head. When the trigger is pulled, the mini arrow is released. Unran, the collector of unusual and exotic weaponry, demonstrates how to shoot the sleeve arrow. At short range, the sleeve arrow was surprisingly accurate. Ancient records say that sleeve arrows could hit targets up to 30 paces away. There are many similar kinds of concealed weapons. Mechanical range concealed weapons like this are usually sleeves arrows, needle tubes, and of course the flying guillotine. All were mainly used for assassination. All sorts of strange and exotic weapons flourished in China. Using a weapon that doesn't look like a weapon has an important advantage. Effective offense is often based on doing what one's enemy least expects. Sometimes that means using a concealed weapon. At other times, it can mean using exotic weapons, such as the twin deer antler blade. Antler-shaped blades are used in pairs, one for each hand. Each deer antler blade has three sharp points and seven cutting edges. In combat, the deer antler blades are compact, sharp and versatile. They can be used to pinion an enemy. With multiple cutting edges, they can slice the enemy from any direction. And the three sharp points can inflict terrible wounds. An even more strangely shaped weapon is the ring or wheel, a metal hoop with sharp blades around the perimeter. Popular around a millennia ago, during the Song Dynasty, they came in a huge variety of forms. The crescent-shaped spade is derived from an everyday tool, but it was never used for digging. Most people were prohibited from owning conventional weapons like swords, so they adapted spades and other agricultural tools as weapons. Like the spade, this rake is another farming tool that has been modified for lethal intent. Kung Fu weapons don't have to be big to kill. Erme needles are only around 25 centimeters long. The points at both ends make them particularly dangerous at close range. The ring pivot at the center of each needle improves grip, enabling the thin needle to stab with deadly force. Looped onto the middle finger, Erme needles are twirled to distract and confuse the enemy. As with Dark Judge brushes, the enemy's temples, eyes, and throat are the target. The Erme needles and the rake are exotic weapons. They work because they are unexpected. Unlike obvious weapons like the sword, weapons that looked like farm tools were easy to disguise, which made them difficult for the authorities to discover and confiscate.
The dang is another weapon that is easily disguised as a farm tool. Only the profusion of sharp points gives the secret of its real use away. The dang first appeared around five or six hundred years ago. It can be used as a spear or to hold the enemy at bay. Hoop-shaped exotic weapons may be hard to handle, but thanks to their profusion of sharp points and cutting edges, they maximize the chances of hitting an opponent's vital areas. Rings can even hold their own against long weapons. In skilled hands, they can immobilize larger weapons with locking moves. Double mallets are one of the oldest weapons in the Kung Fu arsenal. Adding sharp edges to a cudgel increases its ability to crack skulls and break bones. Mallet heads can be rectangular, oval, melon, or diamond shaped. Regardless of their shape, they have only one use, to bludgeon an enemy into submission. Extremely powerful, the iron mallets can strike lethal blows. Twin hooks are double weapons, one for each hand. They are hook-shaped swords with an extra crescent-shaped blade on the handguard. They act as four weapons in one. The hook blocks the enemy's blow. The main blade chops and slashes. The pointed tip at the bottom stabs like a dagger. and the crescent-shaped blade around the handguard and slice up the opposition. Some of the strangest Chinese weapons don't look like weapons at all. Strange means not usually seen. A strange weapon is something that you wouldn't normally regard as a weapon. Influenced by his antique dealer father, 29-year-old An Ran has been collecting weird-shaped and unexpectedly disguised lethal weapons from all over China since the age of 20. This is a tobacco pipe sword. When least expected, a blade suddenly appears to strike at an enemy who is caught totally off guard. A genuine antique, this tobacco pipe sword is several hundred years old. Dating from the Qing dynasty, its thin, hidden blade marks it out as an assassin's stealth weapon. Anran now has over 300 weapons in his collection. The strangest of the lot is this 400-year-old iron claw. It looks like an instrument of torture, but it's not. As this name implies, it used in combat to claw at an enemy. This is where you found its lethal effect. It used to be cutting edges here, as well as sharp tips. These were the main killing areas. As for the claw, its main use wasn't in fact for killing. Catching the enemy off guard and preventing him from escaping, you simply place it on his shoulder and lock it tight. Escape will be difficult, if not impossible.
Most kung fu fighting is done up close and personal, but sometimes hand-to-hand -hand combat is not appropriate. One of the best weapons for long-range attacks is the rope dart. The dart was used primarily as a stealth weapon to launch sudden attacks from behind on unsuspecting victims. The rope dart is composed of a rope usually about four meters long with a metal dart at the end. The dart is either conical or diamond shaped and between 16 to 20 centimeters long. The red cloth is not for decoration. Placed 20 centimeters from the dart, it confuses the enemy's vision. The rope dart is an extremely difficult weapon to master. The rope dart makes use of energy from the fighter's neck, shoulders, elbows and other joints to attack from a distance. The meteor hammer is the flying dart's big brother. Like the flying dart, it is spun on a rope, but its heavier weight makes it spin faster and strike harder. Meteor hammers are used singly or in pairs. In the single version, the rope is approximately five meters long. One end of the rope is tied to the wrist. The other is connected to a bronze melon-shaped hammer. The meteor hammer is the military version of smaller flying weapons. It is a distinctively Chinese weapon that can be traced back to the Warring States period of around 400 BC. Water-filled pots bring home the full, devastating force of the meteor hammer. More powerful than its little brother, the rope dart, the meteor hammer can pulverize a pot from a distance of four meters. Skulls are harder than clay pots, but smashing them is just as easy for the meteor hammer. But the most lethal Chinese weapon of ancient times didn't just smash heads, it removed them. Perhaps the most secretive Chinese weapon of all time. It was the ultimate stealth weapon. Used by assassins, it had just one purpose. Decapitation. Its name? The Flying Guillotine. We've reached our number one killer on our countdown of China's most lethal weapons. The Flying Guillotine was linked to the 18th century emperor Yong Zheng's extraordinary rise to power. With absolute ruthlessness, he seized the throne. Legend says that he even murdered his father and his brothers. Many rumors circulate in society at the time about him murdering his father and brothers, his greed, his love of wine and women, and so on. For a long time, the people thought of Yongzheng as a tyrannical, calculating, and vicious emperor. The emperor's reputation wasn't helped by having his own private army of assassins. The legendary army went under the innocuous sounding name of the Pole Hoisting Authority. Their official task was to organize the emperor's hunting and fishing trips but it was their unofficial duties that struck terror in the court. It was rumors surrounding the death of one of the emperor's brothers that first gave rise to stories about the flying guillotine. But when the body was found, the head was missing. The emperor's assassins were presumed to have done the deed, but no one knew how. I heard about flying guillotine when I was little, mainly from magazines, martial arts novels, as well as movies and TV. The flying guillotine appeared in them all. Featured in countless martial arts movies, the flying guillotine is the ultimate weapon of fantasy. 
But did this legendary weapon truly exist? Wu, a film buff and art director, is keen to find out. The problem is that no one has ever seen a real flying guillotine. So Wu decides to design one for himself. Wu concludes that the flying guillotine should resemble something like a hat big enough to cover a person's entire head, with some sort of mechanism at the bottom to activate the blades to decapitate the victim. Consolidating all available folk legends and descriptions of the flying guillotine, and adding a little imagination of his own, Wu works out a design diagram for the mysterious weapon. The entire design should be like this. There's a cover on top and a soft back below, and it's underneath where you find the mechanism. Wu's recreation is comprised of three movable blades. A pull of the rope snaps the spring-loaded blades shut. It's an elegant design, but will it work? There's only one way to find out. Wu takes his drawings to a workshop where craftsmen can turn his design into reality. They construct a blade mechanism from wooden boards. It resembles a camera shutter, but instead of cutting off light, this one cuts off heads. Wu's colleagues use modern technology to make a flying guillotine. But was technology 250 years ago in the Qing dynasty up to the job? Wan Xiaoqin, a researcher at the Chinese Academy of Military Science, has no doubt. The killing principle is based on the blaze, and such blaze could be constructed. In the Qing dynasty, it would have been possible to construct such a flying guillotine. This is the flying guillotine that we made. I'll now demonstrate how it works. It covers the victim's head like this, and then you pull this chain. That's how it works. It's a simple design. That's the top, a cloth back in the middle, and the most important part, where the mechanism and the blades are located. How do these blades work? They work when you pull on this chain from afar. I'll demonstrate for you. When you pull on the rope, the blades all converge inwards. Building it is one thing, but how in the world do you get this onto someone's head? Kung Fu master Ken Yun needs all his 30 years experience to discover the answer. I think, other than throwing in the normal way, another method would be to leap up and toss it onto someone's head from above. Throwing strength and accuracy are the first things that need to be practiced. Timing is also crucial, as the victim won't just stand there to be targeted. Did such an incredible weapon exist? Could it really work? Jung and his team are put to the test. First, he'll try it the most straightforward way. As this flying guillotine weighs one and a half kilograms, hitting a target accurately is no easy task. But after repeated attempts, Jung concludes that it can be done. Which power needs to be great? You also need a strong arm and good accuracy. If you manage all three, you've got a good chance of success. Jung reckons that warriors in ancient China would have been skilled in leaping. He thinks they may have deployed the flying guillotine while in mid-air. With the aid of a trampoline, Jung's assistant attempts to do just that. He's a trained stuntman, but even he finds it difficult. It takes five attempts before he finally does it. Okay. 
如果冇咁嘅功夫，我做唔到。You need a certain level of kung fu skill before you can master the fine guillotine. A lot of vigorous training is needed. Emperor Yongzheng had the motive. His craftsmen had the knowledge. His assassins had the skill. But did the flying guillotine ever really exist? Fact or fiction? No one knows for sure. Only one thing is certain: if Chinese craftsmen did build the legendary flying guillotine, it would have been the ultimate kung fu killer. Thank <laughs> you. 